All right, everybody, time for a new type of function and a new formula for a derivative. Okay, <clears throat> so we, in this part of calculus, we'll be talking about different kinds of functions and their derivatives. Okay, so I'll show you our new type of function, which will be an exponential function, show you the rule that we'll use for finding the derivative, show you some examples on that. And then um, I'll show you something to remind you what the derivative tells us, because no matter what type of function we have, when we find the derivative of that function, it gives us the same information. Okay, so no matter what the rule for the derivative is or what the function is that we started with, the derivative tells us the same kind of thing. All right, so anyway, uh, so this this time we'll be dealing with the exponential function all right and then exponential functions are largely based on something called Euler's number it's uh, the number e which you would have well e is just the symbol that we give to it e is a letter not a number but the symbol we give to this number is e and it's about equal to 2.718 so why do we give this number a symbol that's a letter well you actually can't write down the entire decimal expansion of this number this is an irrational number, meaning that the decimal expansion would go on forever. So we can't write the number down uh, in its full capacity. So that's why we give it the symbol E. So that's Euler's number. Uh, an example that you may have heard of already, if you took algebra before you took calculus, is this formula. A is equal to P times E. And by E, I mean this number right here, a number that's... a, a approximately equal to 2.718 uh, e to the power rt uh, and that's our formula for continuously compounded interest where p is the principal amount a is the principal plus any interest earned along the way r is the interest rate and t is time and the units have to be in agreement here with the interest rate and time like if the rate was a percent per year then time would have to be in, in years. Okay, anyway, so that's one example of when we might see Euler's number, continuously compound interest, but it's also used in population growth models, uh, radioactive decay models. Uh, it's used in lots of different capacities. All right. Okay, so that one number is our basis for um, most of the exponential functions we see, okay? Now, the rules for derivatives are going to be like this. We'll have either a function that's e to the power u or a to the power u, where a is some positive constant, okay? And I'll show you examples of each of these, but the derivative with respect to x, okay, that's otherwise just the derivative of e to the power u is e to the power u times du over dx. So you could think of that as being e to the power u times u prime. You know, this u, whenever we have a chain rule of some kind, uh, a chain rule is for any composite function, uh, like which is like a function inside of another function. But um, whenever we have that, that u is some function that involves x. So an example of this e to the u power might be, here's, here's one that we're, we're going to do here in a minute. Um, this first one might be if we had y is equal to e to the power negative 17x. Okay, so I got e, all right. And then the exponent, the u, is some other formula that has x in it. So I like ne negative 17x. And all right. So the derivative of that would be e to the u times the derivative of the u, or however the rules would say to do that. Uh, and then the next one, the derivative with respect to x of a to the power u, where a is some positive constant, is a to the power u times the natural log logarithm of a times du over dx. So we might read that a to the power u times natural log of a times u prime. So now a being a positive constant, that might be like something like uh, y is equal to 5 to the power x squared. So 5, that's a positive number, but it's a constant. So in calculus, we have to uh, 
mentally differentiate between constants and variables. The x and the y are variables in our functions, typically. You can have other variables, though. But the 5 is a constant, because 5 is 5, right? But the x could take on different values. All right. Just like this formula for our compound interest. Maybe the interest rate is fixed and the principal is fixed. Maybe they're constants. They're known. They're not going to vary or change. But t, the time, uh, maybe that's the variable that we want to play around with and see how much interest we earn over varying amounts of time. All right. So there are constants and variables. So now let's, uh, let's put these formulas to, to use. Okay. So this first example says you have uh, y is equal to e to the power negative 17x. So first of all, um, let's make sure that we see all the parts of this formula. That's the u, right? u is negative 17 times x. So uh, the derivative of e to the u power is e to the u power times u prime, okay? e to the u power times the derivative of the u. So if I want to find the derivative dy over dx, also sometimes goes by the notation y prime, then that would go like this. So y prime is, so that formula is e to the u power then times du over dx, or then times u prime, okay? So that's it. now course like I want to label this like this part right here that's e to the power u from my formula and in this part the negative 17 that's the u prime that's the du over dx that's the derivative of negative 17x okay now you have to know that rule already you know as a separate issue like so if I said it, outside of this video what's the derivative of negative 17x according to the rules you'd have to know it's negative 17. If that's something that you're not sure about then you could ask or um, I uh, could uh, refer you back to earlier videos that I posted about that. Okay so let's see I have uh, my Final answer, y prime. Let's see it. These are just multiplied. So let's do negative 17e to the power of negative 17x. All right. So there's my derivative, my answer for y is equal to e to the power of negative 17x. Okay. All right. Here are the parts of the rule right there. Now, um, let's try this one as a follow-up. Okay. Because in part like this one is no different than this one uh, do you see how like if i had e to some uh, a power and that power was some number times x whatever that number is would just show up here as a coefficient okay that, that will work out every time so um part of that is what's going on here so if i said do you see just the e to the power negative 2x Okay, just that part. What's the derivative? Just that part. I know there's more stuff there, but just that part. It'd be negative 2e to the negative 2x. Okay. So I got that part. Uh, but what about the whole thing? Like, there's more stuff there. Like, and well, how do we think about it? Um, well, so it says x to the ninth power times e to the power negative 2x. Well, that is a product of two functions. f prime g plus g prime f, right? The derivative of the first function then times the second plus the derivative of the second then times the first. Okay, all right, so let's see, f prime, that'd be the derivative of x to the ninth power. That's nine times x to the eighth power, okay? So that's f prime, then times g, that's e to the minus two x. So the derivative of that first function then times the second function as it is, plus the derivative of the second function, that's g prime. Okay, well, so I remember I worked that out in advance because I said, well, that it's like that problem I had done up there. So negative 2e to the minus 2x, so g prime, 
and then times f. All right, so that's how my product rule is going to work out. In addition to having to know this uh, derivative of that exponential function. Okay, all right. So let's see. Um, I mean, it's almost always like when we learn our rules for derivatives, we get the answer in one step. So right here, this is y prime, or that's the derivative, and, and so on. But um, it, there would be an additional matter of if I could simplify it. Okay, so I have my answer, and it's just a matter of could I write the answer in a simpler way with less stuff and smaller numbers and, and so on. So the one thing I can do to reduce this a little bit is I notice some common factors, okay? Like this, I have x to the eighth power here and x to the ninth power here. So uh, they, you have eight x's in common. You have x to the eighth power in common between the two terms. And then I have an e to the negative two x here and another one there. So I have that in common also. So as far as what's common, I have x to the eighth power times e to the minus 2x. Okay? All right. And then if I remove that, what's left over is the 9. Okay? Uh, a minus and a 2x, right? And when, we can, and when we factor, we can always check our work by multiplying. I mean... If you distribute this back in there, you'll get 9x to the 8th, e to the minus 2x, okay? Uh, and you'll get minus 2e to the 2x, x to the ninth power. If you multiply it back together. All right, there we go. So we might learn other rules, but it might also be the case that rules that we had already learned, such as the product rule, come into play too. Um... Anyway, all right, so let's try another one. Here I have 5 to the x power. Now, that would be like this second rule, okay? You know, this one, it says the derivative with respect to x of a to the power u, where a is some positive constant. So that's, that's like what we have down there, okay? So that derivative is a to the u, natural log of a, then times du over dx. Now, natural logarithms, I'm... As I'm making this video right now, I'm planning to post some review videos from my algebra class where I introduce the concept of a logarithm and, uh, you know, work some examples and show some of the math with that. Okay, so, but, you know, in this video, I'm taking it for granted that you either already watched that or you knew about it already. Okay, so that natural logarithm is, is something I am going to take for granted for right now. Okay, you can look back at the review stuff I post. But that's the rule that we want. All right, so let's see. All right, 5 to the x power. Uh, I like to have things, you know, written together. So I'm going to rewrite that rule. Why not? Derivative with respect to x of a to the power u, a being some positive constant, and u being some function, some formula that has x in it somehow. Uh, is going to be a to, oh, whoops, <laughs> it's going to be a to the power u natural log of a then times du over dx, which you could think about that as being u prime, the derivative of whatever the u is in these chain rules, in these rules that have a, a u function them. The d over dx always just means the derivative of the u, whatever that is. So that would be the applicable rule to this one. All right. So first thing to agree about is that that's the correct rule. Uh, so second thing, all right, the application of the rule, derivative. So I'm going to get 5 to the power x because here my u is x. Okay. And then I do natural log of a. So my a is 5. And then times du over dx, then times the derivative of u, u prime, okay? Well, u in this case is x. What's the derivative of x? It's just 1. All right, there it is, just 1. But that's it, all right? I want you to see for general applicability, if you solve other problems that are a little bit different, 
the general applicability of what I just did for my rule. Okay. All right. So that's, that is how it would work. Uh, now, as far as simplifying this one, because remember I said that when we learn these rules, we can apply the rule in one step, but we, but we take that, which is our derivative, and then we reduce and simplify from there. All right. And the only thing I do this time is say that the one is unnecessary. I wrote the one for you so that you could see the general applicability of the rule. And I drew the red arrows and match it all up. Um, but, you know, it's like not like we need it there in, in terms of a final answer. Okay, so there's our final answer. So let's try one more that is like this, okay? Where I have a constant a to the power u. And I did say up there that this uh, constant right there is, po is some positive number. It's a positive constant. And this one might seem like it's a little bit in violation of that because it says negative 3 to the power 6x squared minus 1. Well, uh, that's the difference. Like, this is okay. This is a positive constant because the difference is like, what's negative 2 to the fourth power versus what's negative 2 to the fourth power like that? Are those the same or different? Those are different. This is the opposite of 2 to the fourth power. Okay, so well, let's think about that. 2 to the 4th power, two to, that's 16. Take the opposite of that, that's negative 16. What about this one? Uh, well, this is negative 2 itself to the 4th power, so that means it's negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative, oh, that's positive 16, so those are totally different. We, we have this here. This is the opposite of the function 3 to the power 6x squared minus 1. Okay? Um, anyway. So, yes, that rule is applicable. Um, you know, we have, you know, a, a negative 1 in front of our function, which is okay. All right? So, there are, in this one, a couple of two rules happening as well. Remember this one, there are two rules happening. There was the rule for the derivative of the exponential function, and then there you had to use the product rule on top of that. So here, the other rule that goes with it is one of the first rules that I would have introduced was something like this. So you had y, your function was y equals to k, and k is a constant, a fixed number, times some function, f of x. Then the derivative of that function, that the whole thing, is k times the derivative of this f of x. So in other words, when you have a constant times a function, when your function is really taken apart as a constant times a function, the derivative of it will be that constant times the derivative of the function itself. And so it's like you carry the constant into the answer. Now, when I do this one, when I find y prime here, all I'm saying is that negative 1 is a constant. And I'm going to multiply it times the derivative of 3 to the power 6x squared minus 1. Okay? So, like, that, that negative 1 is something that gets carried into our derivative. So, now I carry that in there. That's what this is. And I wrote the 1 deliberately so you wouldn't think it was, like, a negative 3. Okay? It's a negative 1 times... And then the derivative of 3 to the power 6x squared minus 1. Well, we have a rule for that. And it's right here. That is 3 to some power u, and that power is a function of x. So let's let's see how this rule plays out. We'll get uh, 3 to the power 6x squared minus 1. Then our rule said natural log of that base number 3. Okay, and then times the derivative of that exponent, the derivative of the u. In my case, that's 6x squared minus 1. So what I put here to finish this off will have to be the derivative of 6x squared minus 1, whatever that is, okay? And we'd have to know how to do that already. Derivative of 6x squared minus 1 is 12x. All right, so then we have everything we need. Uh, does it simplify? Well, I mean, you could rearrange it a little bit, but, but that's about it. Um, 
we could put the 12 up here with the negative 1 since this is all multiplied and say it's negative 12x 3 6x squared minus 1 then times natural log of 3 but like the things don't combine any further than that okay so now we've seen a new type of function and a new rule, new rules for finding the derivative of it. I wanted to, to follow up with one thing because I I would I told you this at the beginning, you know, weeks ago when we started learning about what the derivative was. Uh, but it's it's something that is more sophisticated than just applying the rules, and it might be best if I remind you of it as we go along. So when I like say that I, I say uh, y is e to the minus 17x and then I say from there that's the function then I say the derivative of that function is negative 17 e to the minus 17x what does that tell you what does it mean uh, I said at the beginning of the video that no matter what type of function you have the derivative tells you the same sort of information what is that information what does it tell you so, well, let me remind you that this is universal, and I have brought this up before in different forms, sometimes with application problems and so on, but here it is. Here's your reminder. So, f of x, e to the minus 17x, that's your function. It tells you what y is if we know what x is. You plug the x in, you get the y back out. That's what the function tells you to start with, okay? It's sort of like up here, this compound interest formula if maybe I plug in the time the duration of my investment it tells me a the principal plus the interest that's earned along the way so that's what functions and formulas do okay you put a number in you get another number back out but the derivative okay what does that tell you the derivative tells us how y responds to small changes in x okay uh, so yes that's another story what y is if we know what x is that's one thing but another thing is how y responds to change in x yeah that's a totally separate question that's what the derivative answers to you know because we might want to know is y really sensitive to changes in x uh is it insensitive to change you know if x changes a little does y change a lot there's all kinds of questions like that that we might want to know because change is happening all over the place and things are all linked together so it might be nice to know in general how change in one place uh, affects change somewhere else right so that's what derivatives tell you now I can illustrate that like this now I'm going to just pick a number say I pick 0 for x because it's a nice easy number and I plug it into my derivative and it tells me negative 17 what then can I illustrate that with the changes so yeah, that wouldn't be hard to do. What that means is if x is 0 and changes by some small amount, okay, and how small might, for this illustration to hold, might depend on the function. But, but here's 0, and then I changed it. I bumped it up a little bit to 0 0.001. So that would be like a small change in x. How do I calculate my resulting change in y? Well, I take the original function. I'll put 0 in, and then I'll put 0 0.001 in. So this is a change in x. Go from 0 to 0 0.001. And this is the resulting change in y. Goes from 1 to 0.983144. So our Leibniz notation that we sometimes use comes from our delta notation for changes. So if these are my numbers that I want to illustrate this uh, to you with, okay? then the change in y is 0.983144 take away 1. That's how much y changed if you subtract these numbers. And the change in x that went along with it is 0 0.001 minus 0. And if you work this out, you get negative 16.8. That's very close to negative 17. See? So when we calculate the derivative and it says negative 17, it says, if you take a small change in x and calculate the resulting small change in y and work it out as change in y over change in x, you'll get about negative 17, okay? Uh, now, the smaller the change in x is, the closer to negative 17 you'll get, but like just for conceptual 
I wanted to do this to give you a way to think about the derivative. Okay. All right. So yeah, that this would be a universal way to think about the derivative. It's also how sometimes in my math lab with our questions, the answer for the derivative has the units to it. We always get those units by what are the units for the y variable, whatever it happens to be, over whatever the units are for the x variable, whatever it happens to be. Because in its heart, that's what the derivative is, is the change in y over the change in x. 